So I'd like to give a quick recap of what I talked about last week and also explain the meditation that we just did. And I'll do this fairly briefly. Then I'll respond to some of the questions that have come in about this aspect of practice, the aspect being uh, steadying the mind and what's sometimes called concentration. Uh, Sanskrit, Pali terms for this you may have come across are samadhi or shamatha type practice. And this is an aspect of practice. It's not the whole of practice, but it's very fundamental. You may know that in the Buddhist tradition, it is said that there are three fundamental pillars of practice, virtue, concentration, and wisdom. And we might translate that with different words. You can find those three in other traditions as well, sometimes with different words, sometimes with very similar words. We have the element of morality, restraint, you know, not creating trouble for other people, not creating trouble for ourselves, virtue. We also have the element of mental training. There's a training, uh, concentration, in which we uh, develop greater steadiness of mind. We also concentrate in ourselves various positive qualities like heartfeltness and lovingness and presence and inner peace. We concentrate them in ourselves and we become absorbed in these qualities, including as an opening into non-ordinary transformative states of consciousness known in the Buddhist tradition as the jhanas, the, um, which comprise the right concentration or wise concentration element in the Eightfold Path. And then we have wisdom, insight, vipassana in Pali, insight in particular into the causes of suffering and the causes of happiness, and insight into the ever-changing nature of moment-to-moment -moment experience so that as our insight deepens, it becomes liberating and we hold our life more and more lightly while remaining in the present. So in that context then, it's really useful, especially in our very scattered, scatterbrained culture, um, it's very useful to train in stabilizing present moment awareness because then we have the power to really stay focused and recognize uh, what leads to suffering, or alternately, what leads to happiness for ourselves and for other people. <clears throat> Traditionally, there are five major factors of the jhanas, uh, five major factors of concentration. So the first of these is applying your attention. In Pali, the word for that is vitaka. Then there is sustaining attention, vichara in Pali. Then there is the third factor, which we explored here in Pali, sukha, translated in various ways. I'm translating it as joy, which, as my teacher Christina Feldman taught me, um, has three sort of elements to it. The joy factor, uh, happiness, which um, you know I'm using gratitude and thankfulness as an entry into happiness, a uh, deep sense of well-being that has a certain aliveness to it, and then happiness moving into contentment, a sense of well-being in the present with no wish for it to be anything other than what it is, contentment. And contentment is very profound because it's a direct undoing of the machinery of craving. Because when we feel content, we don't have a sense of something missing, something wrong, which, undo, which undoes the biological drive-based machinery of craving. Contentment is a very underrated positive quality and really a good one to develop. It's something that I, would, I think has been very central in my own practice over the last several years. Contentment, authentic contentment, around which can be sadness or anxiety or moral outrage or a fiery commitment to social justice while still in the core of our being having a fundamental sense of basic all rightness in the core of our being with things as they are. And then contentment uh, can uh, shade into tranquility. Tranquility is one of the seven factors of awakening in the Buddhist tradition, a real sense of genuine, not suppressing anything, genuine calming, calming in the body, calming in the mind. Um, there's a quotation here I want to share with you from Yeats, the Irish writer and poet. Uh, he says, We can make our minds so like still water 
that beings gather about us, that they may see, it may be, their own images in the still water, and so live for a moment with a clearer, perhaps even with a fiercer life, because of our quiet stillness, tranquility, like a mountain pond. So this is the range of the joy factor, translated as sukha, uh, which is the root in the Indo-European languages of Pali and Sanskrit of the word for sucrose and sugar. There's a sweetness in it. It has to be authentic. It's not forced. But it's quite remarkable to appreciate that happiness is skillful means, including its subtler forms of contentment and tranquility. It's beneficial in general because it motivates us to practice that we can find a happiness uh, independent of our external conditions. And also this happiness neurologically in ways that I explained last week, and I'll spare you the gory details tonight. You can listen to the recording from last week, or you can learn more about all this in my book, Neurodharma, whose first of seven major practices is about steadying the mind. And frankly, I really recommend you get the book. Um, it's got a lot in it that's very, very experiential and practical and explains this intersection of Buddhism and brain science that we're exploring here. Okay, so we have that uh, third factor of, um, hap of joy. Then there's the fourth factor, which I didn't talk about tonight, translated typically as rapture or bliss. This is an intense sense of, <gasps> ah, you know, <laughs> in your experience, uh, it's not so typical. So if you're wondering, am I feeling blissed? You're not. You know, when, when the bliss comes, it really grabs you, whoosh. It reminds me of uh, when my uh, grandfather taught me to fish. Uh, I asked him, how will I know there's a fish there? He said, you'll know, Rick. There's something very alive and very intense uh, that, you're, that you're in touch with there. So uh, bliss is something that we often experience on retreat. Sometimes some people can feel it in everyday life. I think for many people, me included, it's hard to just sort of drop in on bliss, doing an online meditation once a week. Uh, so I kind of went right by it. But it is interesting to come back to it. It, there's often a sense of a rising energy. You can have sort of rushes or surges of bliss, uh, just ah, like, like an intensity, a very embodied intensity of joyfulness, the bliss factor. And then there's the fifth factor, the one that we did explore here that I did talk about, translated typically as singleness of mind or unification of consciousness in Pali Ekagata. And I just touched upon it here. There's a sense of whew, you are yourself as a whole, undivided, nothing left out, stably, present, whew, unified, single. We can begin to certainly have experiences of that, perhaps quite deep experiences of it here, and with practice, with repetition, um, the sense of singleness of mind, unification of consciousness, it's called, can become very stable and very accessible for you. In terms of our practice, a way into singleness of mind, I think, is through getting a sense of your body as a whole as you breathe, starting with smaller parts of your body, such as your chest as a whole, and then moving out to your whole body, bringing in sounds and hearing, and then bringing in other objects of consciousness, other experiences, as simply parts of an undivided whole, or aspects of an undivided whole that also includes awareness in a non-dual sense, consciousness as a whole, you in the broadest sense, as a whole as a whole process of being now. This is super cool stuff. So these are five traditional factors. We explored them last week in some depth. And I would like to also quote here from the Dhammapada because uh, these factors uh, can be trained while we meditate. 
it's not so much that they are to become a way of life or we are to always be in a state of bliss or, you know, total wholeness all the time. It's hard to function in that way. On the other hand, uh, with training, we can develop these qualities so that increasingly they're woven into the tapestry, the fabric of our own consciousness, and they're more and more present with us. And we can drop into them and surface them more and more readily. So the quotation here is from the Dhammapada, wisdom springs from meditation. In other words, it's through this training of concentration, of purification of our consciousness as we become increasingly concentrated in what is beneficial and wholesome, and the dross, the impurities, the chaff is gradually purified out as we become increasingly concentrated ourselves and that which has always been there and becomes more present and more accessible and more radiant. As this happens through meditation and through meditative practices in everyday life, which I'm about to get to, um, our wisdom develops. We become increasingly clear. The veils fall away from our eyes as we become increasingly concentrated. We're less and less afflicted, less and less distracted by various desires or beliefs or feelings of different kinds. They, they preoccupy us less and less. So wisdom can stand out more and more. And as it says in the Dhammapada, wisdom springs from meditation. Without meditation, wisdom wanes. Having known these two paths of progress and decline, let one conduct oneself so that one's wisdom may increase. So there's a calling here to a cultivation of concentration and steadiness of mind, including through formal practices of meditation. And I can tell you right now, you want to know the best meditation to do? The very best meditation to do is the one you will do consistently. <laughs> That's the best one. The one you will actually do. And I can speak <laughs> from some experience about that. Okay, so I want to see what kind of comments or questions have come in so far. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to just respond to some of the stuff that's come in so far. So I'm going to take a big swing at the topic of non-dual. People use this term in different ways. I use it in three different ways that, for me, are meaningfully distinct. And um, so I'm, <laughs> I'm dualistic about <laughs> non-duality. Right. One kind of non-duality is in terms of our own experience where we experience our consciousness as an undefined, undivided, single, unified whole, with awareness included. So the distinction between awareness and its objects falls away. The distinction between self and what self observes falls away. There's simply consciousness as a whole within ordinary reality, okay? This is a subjective form of non-duality. It's a phenomenological form of non-duality. Second, I think there's another very meaningful form of non-duality that people talk about and experience in, that's objective, in which the sense of the distinction between person and world or person and universe just drops out, falls away, or becomes very soft and permeable and hardly meaningful at all. That's a different kind of non-duality. That's a sense that there's a recognition that the universe is one single, unified, undivided, undivided whole. The universe as a whole is non-dual, in which this body-mind process is unfolding. That's another meaningful kind of non-duality. And then I think there's a third kind of non-duality in which the distinction that um, is routinely made between the natural, ordinary Big Bang universe and ultimate, absolute, potentially transcendental, maybe divine, ultimate reality falls away. And the natural, ordinary Big Bang universe is seen as a kind of expression of the absolute. And in that very ultimate, profound, uh, sometimes mystical sense of non-duality, uh, it all is one. The natural, the ordinary, is an expression. It's a patterning, a passing patterning of the infinite. 
that's really deep stuff. So I'm just calling out these distinctions, not to try to argue, especially for the last one, but to um, give ourselves sort of ways of exploring our own practice. And in my own view, all three kinds of non-duality are really useful. I'm perfectly content to stay within the natural frame, uh, within ordinary Big Bang reality for those who want to. And then we have the first two of the three kinds of non-duality. And then for those who, like I, have a sense of the transcendental and an interest in it, you know, that exploration of that third kind of non-duality is really interesting, which encompasses the, the previous two. Okay? So now I want to uh, talk about a question that came in f a little further back. Bear with me. From, where am I here? From Fran? No. Well, uh, I'm looking for the question. I think it was from Fran. And what the question was, was essentially whether, yes, here we go. Um, yes. And so I'll kind of do it. We can find refuge in very simple, ordinary, accessible ways in the sense of uh, feeling stably present as various experiences pass through awareness. This is an ordinary kind of um, stability that is really good. It's like feeling centered and grounded. Reactions are arising. You're aware of your, re your reactions, but you're not hijacked by them. There's still dualistic experiencing. There's a sense of an I who's watching my mind, right? I am watching the movie. Uh, you know, in the theater of consciousness, but I am not swept away by the movie. I am stably here while the movie is proceeding. Sounds are occurring, feelings are occurring, reactions are arising. I'm thinking, wow, are they wrong, or wow, am I right, or why do they do that? But I'm not so identified with those reactions. Those thought trains don't just sweep me along. I haven't bought a ticket on those thought trains. Right? That's a very useful kind of refuge. And uh, given how distracted most people are, the key to establishing that kind of peaceful, grounded centeredness is training in concentration in whatever way is useful for you. And I'm going to be getting to that momentarily for everyday life. Okay, That kind of ordinary centeredness, ordinary stability of present moment awareness, Mindfulness, stability of mindfulness in the present. That is not itself these kinds of non-duality that I've referred to that um, are a little more, are more rarefied, <laughs> especially this, it's fairly accessible to have a, that first kind, kind of phenomenological non-duality, a sense of your own consciousness, your own beingness as a single unified whole because that's what it is all the time anyway, right? You just, oh yeah, <laughs> there's one single mind stream here. <laughs> there's yours, there's mine, right? Mine is just one single unified mind stream which, inc which that includes awareness. Not a big deal. I mean, not always easy to sustain an experience of it, but it's not like a mystical sense of oneness with the universe. That's a second kind of object of non-duality that you know, is more a matter of regular practice to start feeling uh, kind of foamier and more porous so that more and more you feel like you're an expression of all that is, you know. And there may well be certain specific experiences that are very non-ordinary in which, you know, radical non-dual experiences in which the division between self and world falls out. Also, in the book, in the practice of the sixth practice of opening into allness, I talk about some of the plausible neurology of what in the world could be happening in the minds of people when the sense of self just drops out, no more ego I, and the sense of the world shines forth in radiant perfection. Okay, that's not that common or accessible, you know, just in everyday life. But this First kind of non-duality is very accessible routinely. I actually talk about it also in the book in terms of the practice of being wholeness, being yourself as a whole, and we can um, you know, observe it fairly routinely. 
And that sense of being your mind as a whole is a step beyond the more ordinary accessible sense of being grounded, being centered, and being able to witness your own experiences without being hijacked by them. The reason I'm making these distinctions is to help ourselves on our own path of awakening so we know what we're trying to train in and we don't just all mush it together. We realize, okay, I want to develop myself so that I'm, I'm less distracted. I'm less hijacked by my impulses. I'm, my, I'm not so chasing the shiny objects in my mind. I'm more stably present and centered. You know, there's a stability of present moment mindfulness. Great. And then, on that basis, yeah, let's say, I'm interested in this sense of akagata, unification of consciousness, the mind process as a whole, consciousness as a whole. What in the world is Rick talking about there? Yeah, I'm interested in that. Okay, good, you get more of that going. And then, maybe you say, okay, this kind of one with everything, that's what the Dalai Lama asked the hot dog vendor for, one, make me one with everything. You know, I want to be one with everything. Okay, good, we're calling that out. And then maybe if a person's inclined, the ultimate form of, you know, non-duality, a sense of accessibility to the transcendental, the absolute, the, the infinite, the divine perhaps. Okay, okay, going after that. But I think it's helpful to, to distinguish among these. And especially for people that are interested in kind of moving, moving on, you know, moving forward in their own practice. All right. So I'm going to take another question here just about these topics as a whole. And then I want to talk about establishing mindful presence, peacefulness and presence in everyday life. Okay. Um, let's see. So what is hijacked? Hijacked is, I got hijacked briefly earlier. Um, I had a little thing with my wife. I said, uh, you know, um, hey, can you take care of something? And she said, yes, dear. <laughs> and I reacted to the word dear. I said, what? There's like some tone in that word dear. And she was, she looked at me like, no, actually there wasn't. And I was like, oh, I made that up, right? I got hijacked for, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm happy to say it was less than a dozen seconds, but it was a real dozen seconds, all right? That's hijacked. We're just kind of carried away by our reactions. People talk about amygdala hijacks. We're just swept along by things. That's what I mean by it. And um, as a longtime therapist, wow, if we can just establish that 1% that watches the other 99% that's going nuts, that's half the journey right there establishing that 1% again and again and again, that witnessing, that stability of, you know, disidentified being with. We feel it. We're not suppressing it. But it's the difference between I have those reactions and I am those reactions. That's hijacking. Okay? So I want to keep focusing on concentration. Good, good, good. Um, I'm going to say another thing here. So <clears throat> a natural, there's a natural tension, and you find people kind of arguing about it in the traditions. There's a natural tension, uh, technically, between practices of concentration in which we seek to become absorbed in one thing. Could be the sensations of breathing at the upper lip and nose. Could be the sensations of breathing in the body as a whole. It could be a feeling of gratitude. It could be a feeling of compassion or love or kindness, whatever it might be. It could be um, absorption in profound tranquility. That's concentration. That's different from what could be called open awareness or choiceless awareness in which we're establishing a stability of presence so that we're not swept away by all that we just are aware of flowing along all the flotsam and jetsam and the streaming of consciousness. <laughs> it takes some train. It takes some training to establish open awareness. That's why it's often useful to start with concentration training, at least a little bit of that, before moving into open, so-called choiceless awareness, or moving into even the sense of consciousness as a whole, in which you're more abiding as awareness, abiding as consciousness as a whole. So they're different from each other. You can see the difference. Where One is getting concentrated, including in the pursuit sometimes, the skilled pursuit 
of non-ordinary states of deep, deep con absorption, such as the jhanas, um, and even moving beyond the jhanas named in the wise concentration element, moving into the so-called formless realms, and then cessation of ordinary consciousness and nirvana. You know, one can pursue that path. That's different from just sitting, shikantasa in Zen, where we just abide as effortlessly as possible, as openly as possible. There's a distinction. They're both useful. And there's often a rhythm in our training in which we um, try to do open awareness, and it doesn't have that much traction for us, as it did, didn't for me. And then we shift into concentration practices so that we can just go more and more deeply and then on the basis of stabilizing that depth, then increasingly, plop, plop. We're just there. And we can, and this is a maybe subtle but important point, as we move into a stability of peaceful, open awareness, we're just there. In effect, we can become absorbed in that choiceless awareness. We can take choiceless awareness as our absorption, becoming increasingly absorbed in it as we absorb that way of being increasingly into ourselves. This all may sound very airy-fairy, but I'm trying to talk about it really very experientially. Um, for you know, and, and this is available to us. This is not, you know, I, I spent 20 years in Buddhist worlds before anyone ever talked with me about any of this stuff. Now, maybe if I'd sought out specific teachers and specific trainings, I wouldn't have had to wander around for 20 years. But I think it's really important to appreciate and, and foreground, right, um, these kind of concentration trainings. This is, there are three pillars of practice, not two. It's not just virtue and wisdom. There's the training, the purification, the development of the concentration pillar of practice too. Okay, so in everyday life, right, uh, how do you actually turn this into everyday presence? So I wanna offer a few suggestions and then see what else is coming in here. All right. Um, Great. <laughs> I see some of the comments come in. I'd kill for more plop. <laughs> that's great. Um, well, I have another quotation for you that's really important. So there are pitfalls in both. You can have their pitfalls in a certain just, eh, I'm just going to sit down and get spacey, you know, <laughs> open awareness, kind of, you know, lazy open awareness. Open awareness is not spacey, but lazy open awareness, there are pitfalls there. There are also pitfalls in concentration training where you get tense and goal-directed and, you know, the sweat's popping out. Uh, literally, I've been there on retreat. Um, you know, you can burn out that way. It's important to have a kind of lightheartedness in it as well. And I want to quote Isa here, the wonderful Zen poet Isa. On a branch floating downriver, a cricket singing. Isn't that cool? Now, given that the cricket's on a branch in the river, we might have some guesses about what might be in store pretty soon for that cricket, right? And still, on a branch floating down river, a cricket singing. May we sing on the branches we all occupy as we float down the river of reality. So, everyday life. Um, one, meditate a minute or more a day. Bingo. This is, Coach, this is Coach Rick talking, and I'm channeling Coach Sylvia Borstein, who confronted a whole bunch of people and said, look, why not commit to a minute or more a day? Make a commitment, a moral commitment that says, I will not go to sleep if I have not meditated a minute, at least a minute. And whatever it is for you that's contemplative, it might be prayer. It might be 
Um, just really feeling your body while you move, you know, and take a minute of yoga before bed where you really feel your, your body and you stay in touch with it. Maybe you sit quietly with your eyes closed and you follow your breath. Maybe you just focus on gratitude. What are you grateful for? Whatever it might be, a minute or more a day. And if you really want to train in concentration, it's actually helpful to choose objects of meditation uh, that you can really commit to whether it's gratitude or sensations of breathing or whatever else you choose, um, commit to it so that during that minute, it's muscular. Maybe it's more than a minute. Maybe you meditate in a muscular way for two, three, four, five, ten minutes in a row and then relax and move more into open awareness. That's a common, that's a common rhythm. And then if you start getting spacey and distracted, reestablish concentration for a minute or two or three or four in a little more muscular way, and then you know meditate however you like. That's a very normal kind of rhythm. But if you are gonna concentrate in that muscular way, go for it. One thing I loved about concentration training, unlike my kind of <laughs> spacey, spacey lazy meditation uh, back in the day, is that it was very straightforward. It wasn't complicated. I was either on the object of attention or I wasn't. It's a, it reminded me somehow of going to the gym, you know, lifting a weight there. Like you're either lifting the weight or you're not. Right? You're doing it or you're not. So same with concentration. You're applying attention and sustaining attention or you're not. And that will train you. Um, pick objects of meditation that are stimulating enough to keep you there. And if your temperament is more toward the jackrabbity, you know, spirited, distractible end of the continuum, Choose an object of attention like your body as a whole or the sensations of breathing while you walk or something that's juicy like lovingness or you know the intersection of, of happiness and love that's pretty juicy, really juicy, so you can stay with it. On the other hand, it's like lifting weights. If it's a one pound weight, you're not gonna train your muscles. You know, it's, so it's helpful to choose objects of meditation that are not super stimulating so you actually have to train in attention and attentiveness and concentration to stay with it. Um, so that's my first suggestion. Train in concentration. Do it. <laughs> a minute or more a day. Don't fool around. Second, many times a day, many times a day, come out of the simulator. What I mean by that is that um, on average, people who are routinely pinged throughout the day and asked, are you present with whatever you're doing or is your mind wandering? The average person will say that their mind is wandering half the time. So our mind wanders. For many people, the mind wanders a lot. And so one of the things we can do to establish uh, you know, stable presence in everyday life is to catch our mind when it wanders and come back more and more often. Technically, when our mind is kind of wandering, it's what's happening, if you think of it structurally, and I'll use the metaphor of the figure and the ground. So the figure, you've seen these pictures, um, you know, imagine the figure is like, uh, I don't know what, uh, a cup, right? And then the ground is the space around it. So. When, our, when we're losing our sense of the present, we typically are focused on tasks, so we're zeroed in on the figure of the task, or when we're not in the present, we're swept away in some reverie, some daydream, maybe some rumination, some negative preoccupation, and we're kind of caught up in a little mini movie. Either way, in a sense, we're kind of in a simulator. We're, we're imagining certain kinds of experiences which particularly draw upon cortices, cortex, cortices in the midline of the brain. There's a place for that some of the time, but being there a lot of the time means we're not in the present, right? We're typically caught up in the future or the past with a very strong sense of me, myself, and I. So many, many, many times a day, it's helpful to kind of wake up from the spell come up out of the simulator to things as a whole. So we move from figure to ground. As soon as we come out 
into the sense of things as a whole, we're in the present. Isn't that cool? When we have a sense of things as a whole, it naturally whew, brings us right into the present. That's because to get a sense of things as a whole, we move into neural networks, mainly on the right side of the brain for most people, right-handed people, um, switched for many left-handed people, but the same principle. When we move into the sense of things as a whole, we disengage. We reduce activity in these midline networks. We're no longer in the simulator. We're no longer caught up in the future or the past with a strong sense of me, me, me. Whew. Come into the sense of things as a whole. Many, many, many times. And that will become increasingly your habit. It will become the habit of your heart, the habit of your consciousness, this ongoing sense of things as a whole. Even when you find yourself doing things like doing the dishes or grinding through emails or talking with somebody, uh, focusing on something that's important, you will retain more of, the, of an ongoing sense of the ways in which that particular figure is really related to and entwined with the larger ground. Is that clear? How do you remember to do that? You betcha. One way to do it, uh, Barbara brings that up, is to set your, your smartphone so that it routinely just randomly pings. Every time it pings, you come back. Another is to use little things like walking through a door. That's tricky to do because you have to remember to remember to remember it. You know, right? You walk through a door. Every time you walk through a door, you reset to the hole. Or every time the phone rings, you reset to the hole. Or, you know, uh, just you put a little stickies around you, whole, whole, whole picture. Maybe you have a gesture like the one I'm doing right here, the whole, you know, get a sense of things as a whole. Uh, isn't it kind of wild, right, that when people have a sense of awe, there's that natural movement, right, into a sense of the things as a whole. All right. So that's my second big suggestion. Again and again and again, make yourself, remind yourself to come out of the various figures of everyday life to a sense of things as a whole. Third suggestion, and I'll finish with this one, is to, if you're at all comfortable with it, tune into the interior of your body repeatedly. Because when we're in touch with ourselves, that engages a part of the brain, the insula, that acts naturally as a circuit breaker for the rearward portions of the midline cortical networks, which is the basis of the so-called default mode networks in the brain. So when you tune into your internal sensations, very simple things, air moving in, air moving out, chest rising and falling, even the sense of your gut feelings, like how do you really feel? What's your deep truth, your deep truth about what, it, what you feel about something or what it's like to be you? As soon as we do that, we um, stop um, being swept away and distracted and kaboom, we tend to come right into the present as we are. So I'm going to finish there and see if there's one person perhaps has a question or something related to what I'm talking about here. There are other ways to come into the present. John Kabat-Zinn, of course, the founder of Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, has a number of wonderful suggestions. Other teachers have suggestions as well. These three suggestions, though, have been ones that I've come back to again and again. Uh, meditate regularly uh, and, you know, Train and concentration, bring a certain muscularity to your meditation without the pitfalls of stressful striving. Second, uh, widen to the whole many, many times a day. Third, come home to the body again and again throughout the day. And this will help you uh, de deepen your sense of mindful presence and peacefulness. Okay, is there anybody that has a question or comment that's succinct and related to what I've talked about here who'd like to get your voice in the room? Where are you? I see you, Art. I see you, Art. I'm going to unmute you. There you go, Art. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I want the, the question has to do with um, contentment versus being out of touch with your feelings. Uh, and a brief story from uh, Jack Cornfield. Yeah. Pre preeminent shaker mover behind Spirit Rock. Yeah. Uh, early on in his marriage. His wife, uh, as the weekend was coming up, his wife would say something like, well, Jack, what do you want to do this weekend? You want to drive to the city? Should we 
go to that lake and swim, you want to go out to the ocean, and he'd say, oh dear, whatever you want to do. And then next weekend would come up and she'd say, well, weekend's coming up, Jack, what do you want to do? Should we do this? Should we do that? Oh dear, whatever you want to do, I'm content. And she says, you know, Jack, you're just out of touch with your feelings. <laughs> and so I don't know. When are you out of touch with your feelings and when are you content? Huh, that's very interesting. Well, I mean, I don't know anything about the details, okay? But just with respect, uh, maybe Jack was out of touch with her feelings. Maybe she wanted him to prize her more and cherish her more and take more initiative to become a co-enthusiast with her. And, you know, that's just a possibility. And again, I'm not speaking about Jack, who I really, really cherish and respect immensely. And and I just want to suggest that there might be more in the mix here. Uh, so part one, which then is a segue in to what you're getting at there, Art, which is um, contentment is incredibly underrated. I think much as um, envy is an underrated negative emotion in its subtleties and the way it works on us as very social mammals, contentment also is underrated. Um, as something that's really, really important for us. We can feel an acceptance and a gratitude kind of woven together. If you think of qualities of acceptance and thankfulness and an easing of stressful grasping, what does that feel like? As I'm using these words, and it, you might have different words, people in general, in addition to you, Art, um, what's the feeling of a kind of acceptance of, of what is? Doesn't mean we like it, but we're not fighting it. There's a, there's a sense of thankfulness. There's a background sense of well-being. You know, it's not neutral. It's actually positive. With, a f with not being carried away at all by any kind of a rising craving or drivenness or chasing. Right? That's the heart of contentment. It's very interesting to be rested in, particularly with repetition, to develop contentment as a trait, while at the same time being enthusiastic about doing things with your partner over the weekend, right? Or being enthusiastic about um, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, your, your, your goals or feeling content if you have a relationship with someone and you're, you're caring toward them, you know, you're, you're a caretaker maybe in part for them, you can have a sense of contentment with your, your situation while also having a heavy heart about things you worry about, right, or, or, don't, or don't feel good about. So, this is the quality of contentment. That's, that's kind of the crux. And so in this contentment, we can still certainly be in touch with our feelings. Uh, and we can be in touch with feelings of, oh, the body is hungry. I am content and, of course, I would want to drink water or eat food. I am content and, of course, I, I want to take the next breath. I, I am content and... I can still have enthusiasm about something I might like to do with my friend or my spouse. The, the, two are, the two can be woven together. It gets at a larger question of equanimity. Equanimity, contentment is a factor of equanimity, but equanimity is even deeper than contentment. It's a sense of complete balance and non-reactivity to whatever is passing through the mind which is not a sense of indifference or disengagement from all of life, right? And, um, yeah, yeah. And I, and I, I remember Sylvia speaking of her, I'll finish on this point because we'll, we'll end really close to 7.30 and then those who want can leave and those who want to stay can stick around and then Kathleen, Kathleen will move you into uh, breakout rooms. Sylvia said to me one time, she said, you know, I would never want to be so equanimous 
that my heart would not be heavy for the suffering of others. Right? You know? Yeah. And you think about people who seem to be exemplars of equanimity and action. Um, you know, in the Buddhist tradition, I think the Dalai Lama, um, Thich Nhat Hanh, come forward, Pema Chodron, you know, come forward. Uh, in the, you know, the sphere of public life, we can think of people who seem to have this quality of grace, even while they're dealing with, with really pressure situations. Um, they have equanimity, but they're not indifferent. They're not disengaged. Right? And if anything, in, in my view as a neuropsychologist, we need to find positive emotions like contentment and love given our biological nature to sustain equanimity in, in a challenging world full of suffering. Yeah. Okay. Now, next week, as I promised before, and I'm really going to do that this time, I want to explore anger. Anger in its various forms. Um, you know, you know the, the, there's some novel by uh, Marquez called Lo Love in the Time of Cholera. Uh, and you may know that novel. It's actually really beautiful, um, Love in the Time of Cholera. And these days, I think of love and anger in the time of corona, the coronavirus. COVID, the plague, love and anger, a lot of anger flying around, some of it well-deserved. So how do we explore anger and how do we uh, relate to anger in a way that can still uh, uh, allow for inner peace? And in fact, in our relationship with anger, we can deepen our inner peace right? without denying um, completely valid, reasonable, proportionate anger. So let's sit together for our last minute here. Art, I'm going to just mute you here. And Oh, you muted yourself. I see that. Let's just sit for a minute. Let it sink in. What helps you be steady and centered and content? What helps you feel a fundamental peacefulness and contentment while still being enthusiastically engaged with the world? May you and all beings find a deep and lasting peace. Thank you. Take good care.